Ladies and gentlemen, he's been known to do strange things to Linksys WOT54Gs. Take things apart when you're not looking. <laughs> Mr. Larry Pesci. Whoa. Good morning. How's everybody's hangover? <laughs> Boo. Yeah, all right. I get it. All right, so you know, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the making and hacking of the 2011 Mid Atlantic uh, CCDC badges. Um, so you know, thank you all for coming. If it were me, if I were not on the stage at this time, I'd actually go over and see Carlos. So you know, don't feel bad if you think I suck and you actually want to go see Carlos, because I want to go see him too. When? Oh, so I've got you guys captive because I suck second, right? Was your second choice? Okay, all right. No worries. All right, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the senior security consultant with NWN Corporation's NProtect team, formerly STAR. Yes, my boss is sitting in the audience, and yes, I updated the slides last night to have the right team name because we just rebranded. Okay, I'm also the host of uh, Polycom Security Weekly with my good friend Paul, where we discuss uh, all sorts of recent computer, computer security trends. How many of you have listened to Paul.com already? All right, so you don't need to hear about more of that. And uh, you probably don't need to hear that I've also been an author with Singris for various subjects, including uh, Linksys, WRT54G, uh, Ultimate Hacking, and others, none of which they have for sale over at the store over there. So I'm sorry I can't have you buy one and sign one. So, oh well. Okay. Yeah, they'll, <laughs> they'll sign anybody's books, sure. Yeah, everybody will sign anybody's books. So some current interests, uh, definitely uh, penetration testing and, well, the dirty word, hacking. Uh, of course, the only difference being permission. Okay. Uh, I'm really into doing recon from the complex to the mundane. Um, we've gone as far as to, to theorize and, and do some work for clients um, by buying used SIM cards off of eBay and evaluating their SMS messages. Uh, and phone book entries and, and how we can potentially get that in scope within a pen test um, from looking at geotags and you know, all sorts of crazy stuff including uh, GPS tracking and so forth. So, you know, granted if we're going to do that for a pen test, how do attackers leverage that information as well? So let's at least, you know, think about that and, and potentially put that in scope for some of our clients. Okay. Uh, go figure, uh, I really like wireless of all varieties. Uh, I'm really getting into the Zigbee stuff. Um, just spent some time teaching uh, wireless uh, penetration testing and defenses for SANS. Uh, and as part of that, spent a week in Vegas uh, just last week. Uh, and, you know, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some Zigbee stuff today at a very high level. But uh, it was really great to be in Vegas and actually remember to bring my Zigbee uh, sniffers and all that good stuff. Because uh, I actually got to go walk around the world's largest Zigbee installation. Uh, MGM City Center in Las Vegas has over uh, 15,000 nodes of Zigbee stuff installed in uh, the Aria and Vidara hotels. Um, it ended up with me almost getting chased out of the hotel. I was actually walking out of the hotel down the sidewalk and security was walking out behind me and uh, was rolling up in the van because, well, some guy's walking around the hotel with a laptop. You know, that, that never makes for a good day, it makes him kind of nervous. So next time I'm going to go stay there and what they do in the privacy of my own room, right? What happens in Vegas ends up on the internet. Okay. And uh, as Paul alluded to a little bit during my introduction, uh, I'm definitely into the whole hardware hacking uh, and sort of turning that into some software hacking as well. Um, I've been known to show up at the house, uh, at the studio, at Paul's house uh, for podcast night and he'll say, hey Larry, check out this new thing that I bought and he'll go upstairs and grab paper towels for pizza and he'll come back and it's already a part um, and he's yelling at me because he's never even plugged it in and I've already voided the warranty. So that's why I carry one of these with me all the time and yeah, I flew here so I checked bags specifically to bring one of these. Um, you don't want to see the hotel TV in my room. Uh, Leatherman? So yeah, everything you need. And some things that you don't. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk about why we're here. Okay, um, so how many of you are familiar with the, the CCDC, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Challenge? Okay, so a couple of you, and looks like we have at least one participant here, maybe more. 
Okay, so a little background on the Mid-Atlantic CCDC. Um, it's a challenge uh, funded by the National Science Foundation uh, for college students. And what happens is the college students put together a team, whether it's based out of their computer science club, their computer security club, you know, some sort of common interest in doing some sort of computer security. And not all of them have a, a huge interest in computer security. Um, they put a team together, they compete uh, locally, uh, then regionally, and the, the winners from the regionals are the sort of semifinals. They go on to a national competition, and we end up with one winner out of the deal. So what these teams end up doing, uh, at least at the regional level, um, there's a theme that we, they pick for the, the competition for the year. They put the teams uh, in a room and give them a network to defend. Say, here's the scenario. Um, we've just hired you as a consulting company, university team, and we just fired all of our networking and uh, computer security staff and come in and fix the network. Here's the network, it's yours to use, uh, used to fix it, and why is my email server down? So they're already, the deck is already stacked against them. They're, they're showing up and, and stuff's already broken. They have to start coming in and fixing it. Um, on the other side of the wall, in the next room over, there's a group of people that do pen testing for a living, um, already probably broken into the networks that they're trying to fix. So the deck is definitely stacked against them. Uh, as part of some of the challenges that we've done at the Mid-Atlantic region uh, last year and uh, the year prior, um, we give them badges. And we've wanted to get the badges in game so that they were, uh, they were a hackable asset and a defendable asset uh, for the students to use. So um, each year has a specific theme. And uh, this past year um, was Smart Grid. Pretty cool. They try to get the students involved in some stuff um, that's definitely seeing some, some stuff in the industry. Um, so it was pretty easy. There's been lots of federal dollars uh, allocated to uh, both deploying and researching uh, smart grid technologies. So we figured this would be uh, a great introduction for the students uh, to, to get into this type of stuff. Uh, next year is uh, healthcare. And I've got some, I am hoping I'm asked back to design the badges for healthcare for the Mid Atlantic region next year because I've got some particularly evil ideas. Um, I'm thinking heart monitors, uh, heart rate monitors that the students have to wear while they're administering said boxes, and when their heart rate rises, it locks the workstation. <laughs> and make them wireless so that the red teams can inject uh, false messages so that they're, say their heart rate is too high and the boxes keep locking on them. So that'll be interesting. We'll see how we go. So the challenges that we set up with uh, initially was, OK, we've got, a, we wanna, we've got an idea for a badge. It's smart meter. Now, how do we design something to get this in game? Um, how do we get the students um, something that they can hack, they can learn from, that we can have at an affordable cost, and that type of stuff? And, and then have them have some experience within two days. The real thing that I wanted to do was, I don't have any experience with smart meters. I don't have any of the experience that would make this. So all of the design is based on what Larry understands it, which quite honestly is probably more than most of the students have an idea as to how it's understood. So we uh, wanted to make it real. Let's make it a real sort of environment. So when we think about the, the monthly electric bill, um, you see some fairly static values. You know, in June, your electric bill's higher, you're using your air conditioner. Uh, in the winter, your energy consumption might be a little lower because you're not using your air conditioner, your refrigerator stays colder, uh, those types of things. So this, it's fairly static over a given period of time. And, and over a multiple year period, you can start to see the analysis that you know, things are, are fairly static uh, for the same months. And, and Pretty simple, um, we wanted to have the badges uh, spit out a, a usage. Um, you know, if you use more energy, well, you pay more money, so that's bad, right? That affects your bottom line as a business. So, i.e., we're going to give them a lower score. The object, the higher score they've got, um, the, the better they're doing. Okay, so if they use more energy, their score goes down. If they use less energy, that means they pay less, right? Which means that doesn't affect your bottom line. It's actually good for your bottom line. So that's good. So maybe they get points for using less energy. And we've had some caveats for rules for the game for them. Okay. The overall intent of this game is not baby seal hunt. Oh, that, that would probably have really kicked ass on Nintendo, right? Okay. Um, I, I do apologize for some of the pictures. I really love internet memes, so you'll see some of that. Um, and on the plane over here, I had a bunch of slides that didn't have pictures. So I was just picking random pictures from my hard drive. Okay. And this one happened to be one that fit the criteria for game. Okay. Um, so 
what the ultimate objective about CCDC is and why it's funded by the National Science Foundation is for the students, and I argue even the red teams, all these guys that are doing this professionally to attack systems, is for them to learn. They're there for a learning experience. They're not there to you know, get their asses handed to them in this competition. Because every one of those teams, when they walk out of the door at the end of the contest, has learned something about defending a system, working as a team, um, how businesses operate in an accelerated time schedule, you know, what it's going to be like in the real world under pressure. And same thing for the red teams. You know, working as teams, I mean, how often do hackers work as teams? As pen testers, fairly often. So they, they get to learn all that type of stuff too. Um, some of the other things that we wanted to make sure that we were doing, you know, funded by the National Science Foundation, they didn't have any restrictions on how we did this, but from, from my perspective, I wanted other folks outside of the competition. Uh, in, in the Mid-Atlantic region, there was about 150 competitors, both red and blue teams. Let's make this open, let's make it transparent so that you folks can take from our experiences and, and learn from it and, well, maybe we can have something else better after all is said and done. So we're releasing all the stuff to everyone once it's done so that maybe you folks can find errors in, you know, in my design and point it out so that I learn something so I don't screw this up as bad next time. Okay. Okay. And in combination with learning, um, I learned definitely by proxy that designing a badge and a game to go along with it is way more harder than I ever imagined. Um, so I had bashed you know, my privately Joe Grand for years um, on the whole electronic badge thing and that you know the game sucked and the badges are really hard to hack and all that type of stuff. Uh, I have a newfound respect for Joe and uh, Joe, I'm sorry. So uh, it, it was definitely harder than I ever imagined, but lots of fun uh, and stressful and all that good stuff. So um, we definitely want to, to have the spirit of uh, sharing be open and have everybody able to learn from this after the fact. Okay. So we had some design considerations that we needed to take into account when, when we looked at this. Um, we wanted obscure technology, something that neither the red team or the blue team had uh, a lot of experience with. And Zigbee was the choice given that it was the theme of smart meter. Um, so we're seeing a lot of uh, 802.15.4 and Zigbee technologies in the smart meters. Um, and we're just seeing a lot of this in the mainstream, so let's maybe give them some tools and some knowledge for a heads up for the future. And a lot of the things that we found that, you know, the blue teams, the, the students, had no experience with Zigbee. And most of the red team did not either. So the folks that are doing this day in, day out had very little experience with Zigbee of any variety. So it really ended up being a learning experience for them too. Um, obviously um, funded by your tax dollars, hard at work. Um, there wasn't a lot of money, so um, we had to think about cost. We wanted it to be usable after the fact, which also meant some potential cost issues. And thirdly, cost. Okay, so the cost was a huge driving factor uh, for the badges. Okay, so a little bit of history. Uh, in 2010, uh, I wanted to design the badges for them as well. Uh, we did an RFID uh, access control system. Uh, so we gave every one of the students uh, a rewritable uh, RFID tag that they used to gain access into their facility. Um, fortunately, the red team also had the, the same equipment. They used the same uh, implementation vendor. Uh, so they had all of it as well and they could hack away. Um, the problem is, is that I wanted to give the students everything they needed to be able to m administer their own system, uh, write badges, you name it. Um, the cost was prohibitive. Uh, by the time we got done scoping the badges and all the tools they needed, it was going to be about $220 per badge. That doesn't work, especially on a fixed budget. Uh, instead, we got down to about 12, and um, as Larry being the guy on site as their integrator, um, I had a writer that they were more than welcome to come use, and I was willing to show them how to use it and that type of stuff. So, you know, we worked through those challenges, um, but I failed in delivering them everything they needed to either hack or defend in the game. So, uh, 2011, there was definitely success here. Um, that being said, um, like any other open source project that I've ever encountered, um, we didn't give them all the keys to the kingdom. They had to figure a lot of it out themselves, both red and blue teams. So we gave them this nice little anti-static bag over here on the right, and it told them that they had everything they needed to participate. They had a badge, they had a meter number, and well, the information was out there because they had a nice little URL, which went to this page, 
and let's make that a little better. Okay. So welcome to the open CC, uh, CCDC open meter site. Okay, which we talked a lot about all the, the, the meter, uh, uh, some of the, the stuff in the background. We gave them links to all the documentation, how to use it as a Wireshark input source for a sniffer, um, assembling and communicating. Um, we gave them the libraries. We gave them the code running on their badge. They just had to be smart enough to go plug the URL and figure it out. Um, they wanted to see how the backend scoring code works. Great, so did we. Okay, so we gave them the backend scoring code, which also meant we gave both red and blue team the um, uh, code as well. So they could potentially look for uh, exploits and all that good stuff in there. Okay, so the information was out there. Okay. A little bit about the electronics. Um, it's based on the Freakduino Chibi, so it's an Arduino based board, completely Arduino compatible with the addition of uh, a Zigbee radio and a 2.2 uh, dB Omni uh, RPSMA antenna and more options for power than I knew what to do with. You could add a battery pack on the back, you could power it through a connector, uh, USB, or they had through hole for AA batteries. Awesome. So you know, we can power this you know, eight ways to Sunday. Okay. Um, when we originally started looking in the project when it was, was proposed to us, uh, we were looking at um, coming up with a custom board um, and shield to go along with a standard Arduino. Um, about the time I was sitting down to start you know, doing the eagle for the custom shield, uh, uh, Akiba from Freak Labs in Japan uh, beat me to it and came out with the, the Freakduino Chibi. And he did an initial release of 40. And I was lucky enough to score one of the initial releases. Sent him an email the day that I ordered it and said, if this works out for me, I need 150 of them by year end. And he damn near fell out of his chair. I could hear it all the way from Japan. Because um, he builds them in his garage. He does the reflow with a hot plate in his garage, so he built all the um, SMD work. And uh, yeah, he had to do all those himself, and he was shocked how well this worked. Okay, so we did uh, have a bunch of other badges for uh, operations and those types of folks, but the only ones that actually got the really cool hardware uh, was the red and blue teams. Uh, we got the badge cost down to 32 bucks a person. So we're giving them a Zigbee radio on an Arduino an antenna and batteries for the whole weekend for 32 bucks. And they get to take it home. That was, I, I was happy with that. Um, we did keep some of the cost down. Uh, if you notice on the right hand side of the picture here, there's a bunch of through hole parts. We didn't have Akiba put those on. Uh, he said it was gonna bring the cost up like another 10 bucks for him to do that. Um, so my intern and now coworker Darren and I put those all together, all 150 of them. Uh, we spent weeks every night after dinner, three hours a night, putting these things together. Um, by the time we're done, it takes us 22 minutes, and we can do it in our sleep. I can, pro I can still do it and not have to read any of the manuals and know which way the LEDs and capacitors go with all that stuff. So 22 minutes a piece. That's a pretty decent amount of time. Okay. So we wanted to you know, verify about power consumption. Um, we had never tested how long it would run with AA batteries. Um, so we bought tons of batteries. I picked up uh, just shy of 500 AA batteries off of eBay for about the cost of what it would have taken me to buy like 100 of them at Home Depot. So if you want batteries, um, get them off of eBay. Oh, hell yeah. The problem is the batteries lasted a lot longer than we expected. They'll run about four days um, of doing continuous receive and the intermittent transmit on a set of AA batteries. Competition was three days long. so. I've got tons of AAA batteries, yeah. Way to have batteries for Tiat Walkie, right? Yeah, when the shit hits the fan, yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, um, we gave them the options. That, hey, we don't know how this is gonna work. It's never been tested. You guys are the beta testers for this meter. meter. This is how we sort of build it from the power company to them. Um, and not only do the, the really good guys get it, the bad guys get it too. So you guys are gonna have to do some troubleshooting for us. Um, if you really want to, if you're concerned about your battery usage, you got a USB cable in your bag, you can plug it in and power it off a USB. I said, be careful, there may be some considerations with that. Maybe you should start reviewing some of the code. So what we did as part of the power consumption, we had it spit out a fixed usage. We had it spit out a fixed usage every 10 minutes. The problem is, is that it spits out that fixed usage at the end of the cycle. It doesn't spit it at the beginning. So if you turn on battery power, you wait nine minutes, it hasn't spit out a usage yet, you decide, oh, I should probably plug this thing in. When you plug it into USB, it reboots. 
and it starts your counter all the way back. They were required to wear their badge to gain access to the contest space. If they had to pee, they had to unplug the badge, put it back around their neck, leave the contest space, go to the bathroom and come back. And now you're potentially cycling it two more times within the same period, so now their usage goes down. And there was penalties for having your usage too low without talking to the power company first. So they had some challenges to overcome. Um, they gave them some ideas about how they can uh, turn off their power consumption. There's some LEDs, and well, yeah, they draw power too, so why don't you turn them off? Problem is, you don't know when your batteries have died. You also don't know when the bar board's actually transmitting, because it flashes one of the LEDs when it transmits too. You can do it, you know, there's also some consequences. Okay. So yeah, it's a simulated smart meter. It's, you know, smart meter as Larry understands it, and something that can be dealt with in two days or three days from both an attack um, and a defense perspective. So uh, they talk wireless over Zigbee about the usage. Um, we give them a fixed usage. We didn't have any other ability and to keep the cost down to say, oh yeah, so we are put a, a light sensor on it and do it that way. Yeah, no, we wanted a fixed usage, keep the cost down, and now at the end of our scoring interval, we can say students were supposed to have uh, 600 kilowatts of usage in the last scoring interval because it was fixed and we could measure it. Give them some wiggle room, no problem. Um, the other thing that we did was instead of telling each node about a controller about what their usage was, um, we told everyone, we sent the usage to broadcast. Well, one, it made it a little easier for the attackers to sniff in two days, figure out how to sniff in two days, and we thought about it from the perspective of a mesh network. If power meter is connecting to power meter, um, you're potentially able to see um, the traffic for multiple power meters spread over, spread over a metropolitan area. So give it a little bit of uh, sort of real world considerations and something that we can do low cost. Okay. Um, wanted it simple, wanted the, both the students and the attackers to be able to explore it in about two days and see how long they want to stay up at night. And you know, one of the things that I always had a problem with Joe's badge is that I wanted free op and open IDE tools. So everything was based on processing, uh, the, the programming for the Arduino, and uh, open source libraries. So very few uh, requirements and gave them links to everything they needed. Okay. All right, now it's time for me to get on my soapbox. <clears throat> so um, there's a lot of crap in the community and a lot of the folks in the hardware community that don't like Arduinos, they say it's like tinker toys for hardware hackers. Uh, and well, maybe it is, um, but I tend to disagree because you didn't start, you know, carpenters didn't start building houses um, with two by fours and that type of stuff when they were three years old. They used tinker toys and Lincoln locks. They had to learn somewhere. They had to get started talking about microcontrollers and, and programming and all that type of stuff. So this is why I really like the Arduino platform. Um, give the folks the tools that they need to find out if this is even something that interests them. Um, give them the tools so that they can at least get started. Um, get some of the language under their belt. Get some of the ideas under their belt. Get the electronics under their belt. And then, holy crap, this is awesome. Let's do more. Well, it's a building block. So it sparks interests and, and potentially leads them into more complex projects. Um, and, and some of the other stuff that we want, you know, project requirements was open IDE, leads easier to learn, a low barrier to entry, so that folks could get this stuff hacked and defended in two days. Okay. Not to mention that they're taking an Arduino compatible board home. There's a huge Arduino community that can support them after the contest is over. Whether or not they ever use the Zigbee chip on it, they could do all sorts of other stuff. Okay, so badge code uh, had a couple of uh, couple of issues. Um, the Arduino code uh, is single threaded, and the environment is single threaded. But I needed multiple threads, and we'll see a little bit on why. Um, I was really glad I wasn't the first to need it because I was trying to beat my head about how I can fix this, and I used that community to figure out how to do it. When um, we use the timed action library which waits for a millisecond counter. When that counter reaches the certain value defined in the library, it says, oh, okay, if that counter is divisible by, the, the value that we're looking for is divisible by the step, uh, great, go run this function. And it comes back from the function and starts counting again, and when it's divisible by the count again, great, go run function number two. Pretty, pretty elegant way to do it. Uh, was happy with it, it worked great. So do one function or other based on, on the divisibility of your, your tag. So 
Larry, why do you need multiple threads? Spitting out a fixed usage every 10 minutes is one thread. You just go through a loop every 10 minutes, spit out, spit out a fixed usage. So a dirty little secret. We didn't tell the students this, but we gave them the links to show them how to do this uh, through the uh, Freakduino website. When they plugged the USB in for power, they also had a serial console to the badge. So they had one of these. <laughs> See? So we actually have uh, my badge up here. I'm serial consoled into it um, with the serial console and gives them the ability to interact with the badge. So we can uh, start uh, issuing commands to the badge and it will still continue to spit out usage. So um, right now we just gave it the command to tell me what my address of my, my badge, my meter is. Um, we can set that uh, to a different one. And uh, one of the other things that was nice is that we can actually do we can actually use the badge to send packets over the Zigbee radio. No analysis of code needed. You just need to figure out what the message actually was to potentially re reduce everything. They had everything they needed to either hack or defend their badge right here. We gave it to them right out of the box. They just had to go figure it out. Okay. So automatically receive of broadcast messages. Yeah, and you remember we sent all of the messages on usage to broadcast. They could see all of the traffic on the serial console without even having to go through all the hoops for the Wireshark capture. Wasn't particularly nice looking, but as you saw in the, uh, in the terminal there, um, someone had actually sent me some messages. And I did a replay earlier, so here's our usage. They can see what the message format is right there, usage colon space 100. And uh, from the badge number 1337, pay the doctor's boy, right? Awesome. That was not me, by the way. Okay, we can change our meter number, we can inject packets, and we can do one other thing that was interesting, we'll get into the follow-up. Okay, all the tools were there and documented from day one. They didn't need to do any coding, and it was all readily available in the documentation to the point of going to the website, looking here, and here's your commands to start sending packets. That was in the links from the, the website for the Chibi Duino. Okay. So again, back to the documentation. Uh, the anti-static bag had a URL to the website that had all of the badge code. Um, they can get all the message formats they needed. They can reflash their badges if they screw it up as long as they got their uh, address. And yeah, this is one of those slides where I went through random images on my hard drive. Um, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so of course you collect things like this. Um, they also had the links to instructions to turn their badges into Wireshark sniffers. So uh, how do you like my new girlfriend? I just met her a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, but you've been with me the whole time. All you have is my hand over there. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so the same URL that was on the, on the bag also had the, all the links to the backend scoring code they could now develop their own messages and see if it, how it was going to be processed by the backend scoring code. Uh, it was a couple of shell scripts and some Python and with very few requirements for them to set up. Um, it was basically you copy it off, you unzip it, and, and off you go. So you can start processing your own messages. Okay. Um, both the red team and the blue team had the ability to do this, um, which turned into a little bit of issues for them. Okay. So for the code, um, we used uh, Killer B by Josh Wright on an RZ USB stick. Um, we did uh, manual start stop for scoring rounds. They'd say, hey, by the, this is the end. Let's stop. We'll take the packet captures off. We'll run it through our scoring engine and do it that way. Um, and a couple of uh, shell scripts and some Python. And a big thanks to Carlos Perez uh, for helping with that. And uh, also a big thanks to uh, Mr. Cutaway for loaning me his RZ USB stick because some dumbass left his at home. So it makes my demos a little hard to do to inject traffic when you don't have the hardware to do so. So again, thanks, Cutaway. Okay. So as part of the scoring, uh, we actually used the RSB USB stick on a Linux box uh, and monitored all of the traffic headed to broadcast and you know, everything headed out. So uh, multiple channels available, and this was what they were told as well. All of the badges were on channel 15. Not a single person asked us to change the channel even when they were being attacked. I had the ability to support sniffing on multiple channels so they could still be scored, not a single person asked. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we ignored everything else. 
Um, and we said, yeah, we have on demand the ability to add additional channels if you want to. Um, you know, standard type of um, technologies in use here. Um, however, the data portion of the packet um, was completely arbitrary, which we got to do, and shows up as being malformed in Wireshark. So they had to sort of figure that out. It was really easy. You just go turn off uh, six low pan um, deciphering for Wireshark, and well, now the message is at least readable. Okay. Okay, so again, we did use different hardware on the scoring engine and the AVR USB stick, about $40, and uh, you didn't need to modify it with a killer B firmware because it was just sniffing. Uh, and we used the uh, Daintree SNA output because it's uh, ASCII text and was a hell of a lot easier to process with a shell script as opposed to writing Python app to process PCAPs. Uh, because I suck at programming and um, also don't know Python very well. So it was way easier for me to do a shell script to do the post-processing. Okay. And we get an output of usage per person and some Python to group that by team. Okay. Um, so being a bad Python programmer and all this type of stuff, first time it's ever been used, um, the scoring was very organic. Yeah, we gave them the ability to play a little bit. You know, your usage is going to vary per month, per year. Um, so we gave the folks um, the ability to say, hey, you want to take a couple badges offline and have your usage go drop to 400? That's cool. You don't need to do any authorization to that. Um, take your badge off, you know, reflash it as a Wireshark sniffer, do your thing, take another one. You want to, you know, start injecting messages and, and change that stuff? That's great. We're not going to penalize you for being within a reasonable range of your energy consumption. Okay. Um, we knew that there were five people on a team and they're supposed to have 100 or 600 kilowatts of usage and a scoring per period per badge, so their usage should be 3,000. The math was really easy to do. Let's keep it round numbers. If it's 1,000 lower, okay, no big deal. If it's 1,000 higher, no big deal. When it starts going outside of those ranges, maybe you guys should start looking at some of this stuff. Okay. Um, we told them to be mindful of their usage. Maybe you should be looking at your own usage. usage. We've given you all the tools to do so. And you can make it lower if you want, but defrauding the utility, right, as me, the scoring engine, is a crime. Um, same thing in real life. So if you want to install solar panels and have your usage run the meter backwards, you need to sign an agreement with your power company first. Fair enough. Let's make that up as part of the game. We had a couple of teams that did. Good. Okay. So it turns out the scoring turned into a fucking disaster. <laughs> okay. So based on um, the attackers just taking their badges and um, running through all of the possible badge numbers, we didn't make them sequential. Um, we split, split them into two different groups. So they just started badge number 0000, 000 through 99999. So now I had to filter out all what was good known badge numbers for the scoring. Um, they put in all sorts of values for stuff that if they had actually read the code and tested any of it, they would have known. At about the end of day one, I got so frustrated with having to do the scoring for all these extra badge numbers, I told them these are the ranges of badge numbers to use. They didn't listen. Okay. So uh, Excel became my friend and I spent lots of late nights coming up with the uh, um, the scoring. It would have been a lot better had I had spent more time with it, um, but putting together 150 badges ate up a lot of my time. Lessons to be learned for next time. Okay, so I told you I like internet memes. So someone totally has a weird boner right now. You guys all awake yet? Okay, okay, just checking. All right. So challenges from the scoring engine. We had lots of uh, bogus data, high signal to noise ratio. Um, there was lots of noise and very little actual signal. Um, the scoring engine was very linear. It looked at fixed, lengths, fixed length fields in the packet, okay? And it only looked at a three character value for usage. So this meant a positive 999 was the maximum value you could have for usage. It spit out 100. However, that also took up the same place as negative 999, because it only looked at three bytes. So the negative was included in that three bytes. Interesting. So if you wanted to reduce your usage, you had to figure out ways to make that happen faster. Because if someone injected a value of just under 1,000 for usage, well, you only inject one negative usage of 100. So you had to find a way to speed that up or do more badges or, or something of the like. Um, the problem was the red team also did the same thing. They started just throwing all sorts of crazy values and didn't effectively uh, utilize the spaces was given to them. 
Okay. Um, while they were doing that, uh, the red team came up with all sorts of crazy stuff for the badges. Um, they even discovered at least one distributed denial of service attack. Because the red team had a bunch of their badges flashed with some attack code uh, and started bringing both the badges and the scoring engine down. Yeah, awesome. This is why we do this. Um, we're not exactly sure where the failure left because I was scrambling trying to get scoring engine back to work. Um, we're not sure whether it was a load on the transmitter, the receiver, the associated protocol stacks, um, things with Josh's Killer B firm, uh, firmware, uh, stuff with a Killer B code. It's one of those things we still need to go back and look at. Um, they found probably likely bugs all over the place um, and uh, maybe even some of the, the firmware. So we'll figure that out. Okay. So we asked the teams to share all the stuff back with us that they did for attack and defense. And they did. Um, you know, I'm, I, I've had some issues. We, we've got to get some of the stuff back up on the website to give you. Um, they shared all of the badge firmware, and we have the captures for when the d distributed denial of service conditions happened uh, to share with you. Um, when they decided they were going to cycle through meter numbers with a high positive usage to make all of the blue team's usage go off the chart and get them penalized for points. Um, one of the teams uh, took their badge and reprogrammed it to sniff, and when their badge number or any of the team's badge number was seen in the air um, for a positive value, they immediately took that value and retransmitted a negative so that the, the usage would stay uh, even. The problem is they also forgot to look at the three value field, and they said, okay, well, I used 9999, or 999, and we're going to transmit a negative value, which only ended up being negative 99. So they, they missed that as well. So they would have had to do some additional math there. Really good, um, really good concept, but uh, errored in execution. So no, no worries. Okay, so they had, you know, hey, the ability to install uh, solar. Uh, one of them decided they were going to build a nuclear power plant and basically just send all of their badges to high negative values. And I was cool with that because they signed an agreement with the power company. Okay. Um, not one blue team asked if they could change the channel on their badges. I mean, yeah, I, I would have thought that would, that would have been my first choice, um, but then again, they were under a lot of pressure in two days. Okay. So yeah, they got to take something home. They got to take their stinking badges home. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, we all love things with batteries and laser cut acrylic and antennas and little flashy lights and stuff, but they actually got something they could take that was fun and that they could learn from after the fact. Okay. They've got tools that they can now use in the real world. They've got a Wireshark Zigbee sniffer. They've got ports in progress for Killer B that I'm told to be able to use the badge with Killer B. Awesome. Um, we've also gotten the badges in front of uh, smart folks like Josh Wright, the author of Killer B, and uh, Travis Goodspeed. Um, so he has one. I saw him in uh, Pitts, uh, Philly uh, about a year ago and got him one of these so that he could have one to play with and do all sorts of fun stuff with. Um, we've got all sorts of other functionality. It's a freaking Arduino! Whether or not you use a Zigbee on it anymore, great. Go build a robot, a cat feeder, you know, weapon of mass destruction. Do what you want with it. You got something for free and go have fun with it. Whether or not you decide you don't want to do security anymore or Zigbee, well, now you've got other fun toys to play with. Okay. Okay, so a little bit about the future and otherwise known as the present, because roads, where we're going, we don't need roads, and it's called freaking research, right? Okay. Um, we're releasing everything back to the community, the code, uh, the scoring engine, the lessons learned, hence why I'm talking to you guys some about that today, um, the stories from the teams, which uh, we've got some of the methods that they used, the comments that they said, hey, Larry, your badge sucked. Yeah, we're sharing all of those, too. Um, I am a little behind, I do apologize, uh, shortly after the competition when we designed the badge. Um, I was actually living with my mom and my wife and our two-year-old and our eight cats out of two rooms um, because we were demolishing our house and building a new house and moving back in. Uh, so I'm a little behind on getting that stuff up on the website, but it's coming, I swear, I promise. Um, I've got it all, it just needs to get there. Okay. Um, we want to continue to work with uh, Freak Labs for platform enablement. Um, you know, how can we get Freak Labs to be able to produce these boards better so that we can use them for other conferences um, at, at a decent cost? How about we take um, badges from multiple conferences and have them do cool stuff together? Part of the reason we want to give this all back to you guys is that so, hey, maybe we can have some, some community based on this across multiple conferences. 
Um, maybe we can come up with better simulation environments. You know, hey, this was the code as Larry under, this is a smart meter as Larry understands it. It's completely bogus, right? Let's do something better. Um, we've got some issues potentially with freak labs. You know, there's been a whole earthquake and tsunami and that type of stuff. And, you know, Fukushima power plant. Um, they devoted a lot of their hackerspace um, efforts to other projects uh, not related to this, such as helping the citizens of their community with solar power lights um, and the ability to do radiation detection. Um, and, and we fully support that. And from our understanding, the purchase of the 150 badges actually enabled them to have funds uh, to support those projects. So, you know, that's something that makes us feel real good about that. Okay. And sort of as a joke, uh, maybe we can acquire some DARPA funding from Mudge uh, to make this go further so that we can have this go further for multiple conferences, right? Okay. So we have uh, an actual real word, world application from one of the red team members. Um, he loves his Chibi Duino, and yes, sometimes with a jar of beet cream. Okay. Um, big thanks to Brad Bowers, who dropped me a note right before, uh, the, con uh, before the con. Um, and he spoke at DEF CON, I don't know how I missed it, but he took his Chibi Duino and uh, created some firmware uh, in Arduino uh, to be able to make this into a channel hopping XP sniffer. And he tells me that there are loads of interesting packets in Philly. Interesting. So he's got real world tools to now go and start sniffing uh, Zigbee and XB stuff. Um, he released the project at DEF CON 19. Uh, I know one of the uh, former CCDC participants uh, is actually here, ran into him yesterday, and he said, yeah, I flashed it with doing the uh, Zigbee sniffing uh, with the channel hopping, and I believe it was with Brad's code. Um, so that, that's interesting. Uh, and he assures me that it runs great for two plus days on a set of AA batteries. Hmm, interesting to maybe go and drop somewhere. So, all right, that's good. Okay, so some conclusions and uh, wrap up. Yeah, we definitely learned something. Yeah, even me. Um, some of the stuff, you know, definitely learned was, you know, don't wait until the last minute. Um, maybe it's worth the extra 10 bucks to have someone put those things together so I'm not doing them in my sleep. Um, spend more time on doing the code. And even when you do, you're still gonna screw stuff up at the end uh, and have to do lots of manual work. And, and maybe it's a, real, it's a good time for me to learn some more Python so that you know, if my Python mastery was there, I could have fixed that right from the beginning. Yeah, I know, some of my, one of my coworkers would say, don't learn Python, learn Perl. Um, well, yeah, that's, a religious, that's a religious war I don't necessarily wanna get into, right? That's like VI versus Emacs. Yeah, who uses Emacs? Who uses VI? Okay, no, it's all right. Who, who uses Perl? Who uses Python? Okay. <laughs> What's that? Grudge match? Yeah. yeah, going from this audience, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> I think the decks are stacked in one way, okay? So, you know, let's build together and, and be awesome to each other, you know, taking some, uh, some words from um, Bill S. Preston Esquire, right? You know, See, totally into internet memes, right? So let's, you know, let's be excellent to each other. Maybe we can come up with some, some cons that are willing to use the badge and willing to shell out 32 bucks a person. Maybe your conference fee will entry go up. Would someone pay an extra 32 bucks to have come to DerbyCon to have uh, a Zigbee badge? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a pretty resounding yes, right? With an Arduino for 32 bucks? Yeah. All right, let's make it happen. Okay, so yeah, and, and I'm happy to work with folks and we give them all the stuff back that maybe we can make this better. And those folks from CCDC that participated can now come and have a badge that they can interface with all their other badges at con. So yeah, all right, cool. Okay, so yes, uh, it is possible to build a game, a badge with wireless on batteries and that lasts for two plus days. Um, so as much as Joe Grant may not have wanted to admit it, um, yes, it's possible. It wasn't easy, um, and it was way more expensive than some of those DEF CON badges. Um, but, you know, thanks to our tax dollars hard at work, we were able to do it. Okay. All right, so anybody got any questions? Yes. Uh, so it was split about 50-50. Um, some of the teams, uh, they, they didn't have a internet access from the, their actual competition space, but they had internet access available outside of the con space. 
um, which was, was provided for them. They also had internet access at the hotel when the, the time was done. Uh, about the end of day one, half of the teams had gone and read some of the stuff and were working on stuff, spent late hours into the night. Um, there were at least two teams that I know of that it was evident on day two that they were doing no countermeasures whatsoever. <laughs> Their usage was just off the chart. They weren't looking at any of it. They weren't, it wasn't even a concern to them. So, um, it, you know, that's part of the learning experience as, as part of the competition is to where do you focus your energies and, you know, it's like going on a pen test and you find a box that you know you can get into, but you spend three days of the customer's time getting, trying to get into that box and you're not successful. successful. So that was one of the valuable lessons that they learned as well. So, yeah, it was about 50-50. Yes, Ray. Yes, so there were some folks there in attendance, again, National Science Foundation, lots of involvement from, you know, whether it be the military or, you know, other various industry applications. There were lots of folks there in attendance that were very interested in, in sort of the proceedings just because of the fact that the theme was smart meter, smart energy type of deal. Um, and yeah, we did get to have the conversations with folks. And again, that it's, it's all out there, it's all available for them to use as well. And uh, absolutely drop me a note and I'll tell you what limited experience I've got and you know, you know, maybe we can help that. In the back, question? So you mean to say that they may be actually learning from schmucks like me? Absolutely. Shit, <laughs> no, no, the boss is down front. <laughs> yes, question. Absolutely. I mean, you know, so we, have we thought about allowing them to modify the hardware? Um, absolutely. Um, that's potentially one of the things that we're going to see how we can enable out for next year. Um, and, and maybe give them a soldering iron in their kit to go along with it. So, yeah, and you know, maybe give them a, a proto shield so they can do some do some stuff, and uh, and go down that way. And yeah, we've we've definitely talked about some of those uh, types of things. Um, we I, I did a workshop at Hackkid in Boston um, where we did some some hardware stuff. We gave them the ability to build a 555 timer circuit. Um, so it's definitely something that I'd like to see them do. Yeah, another one. Okay, okay. Any other questions? I really suggest doing this. I hate getting junk mail. Um, so if you get a, a, one of these in the, in the mail, um, write Snape Kills Dumbledore in it and mail it back to him and they gotta pay postage. Tape it to a brick. Tape it to a brick. Yeah, that's a good idea. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work anymore. You know, spare change, you know, because that's kind of heavy. You know, sand, you know, take your pick. You know, the paper's good though. You're like really not defrauding them. You actually sent them something important. Right, okay. Um, so if you wanna get in touch with me, we'll uh, leave this up here for, for a minute or two. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, comments after the fact, um, absolutely don't hesitate. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, you guys can get the URL if you can read it off the package, because I had to remember where it was too. You can read it off the package in the slides. And uh, within the next week or so, I am gonna get all of the, the traffic captures and all that stuff up on the website uh, so that you guys can look at it too. Cool, so thanks very much for coming out for me for this morning and, and not going to see Carlos. <laughs> Great, thank you.